Okay, good afternoon. Hello, Hopkinton. My name is Amy Ritterbush with eHop, and this is Know Your Vote 2020 Social Distancing Edition. Uh, this is one in a four-part series where we'll be meeting with town officials to discuss the articles to be voted on town meeting, which will be held on Saturday, September 12th. Joining me here today via Zoom is Gary Trundle, who is chair of the planning board and also a member of the Community Preservation Committee, otherwise known as CPC. So thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with us. Um, and then I'd like to jump right into some questions. All right. Thanks, Amy. You're thanks for having me. Yes. Um, there's been some confusion about the planning board articles on the Warren because the planning board put the articles forth on the Warren, but then they plan to make a motion for no action at town meeting on all the articles. So the public is wondering, can they just still discuss and vote on these articles or not? Um, I think that's the first question. Um, sure. Do you want to do you want to just go through all the questions so that I can speak to sort of provide a little bit of history and background on it and, and answer your questions directly? Sure. And then, um, so can the public still discuss and vote on these articles? Do the zoning articles require a simple majority or two thirds? And what happens if a zoning article is voted down or no action is taken? Is there a difference? Is it true that they can't be brought back in future years? Okay. Okay. Got it. So. I think it's worth giving a little bit of background here. And, and this was, a, I think this was a, a, a challenging debate for, for us as a planning board. And, you know, I think that our initial approach here was that a lot have, as, of time and effort has been put into these zoning articles. We feel that they're very important. Um, and the first time that we voted on whether or not we would withdraw them, I think the general consensus was that um, that at least one of them was particularly important and impactful. Um, and if we were going to include that one in the warrant, then we should probably just include all of them. And um, we ended up scheduling a, a, a second meeting um, in part to, to revisit that. And I think what really drove a change um, for how the planning board was viewing these articles was just thinking more comprehensively about public safety. And, you know, at the end of the day, the, the guidance that we got from our town officials was that we really, in the interest of public safety, we're trying to minimize the risk of, of uh, you know, of, of spreading infection. And the, the less debate that we had, the less people were up at the mic talking, um, you know, the, the shorter amount of time that people were at the, the, the town meeting, um, the, the, the more we would be protecting the public safety and the, the public and, and minimizing the, the safety risk. And so we revisited that. Unfortunately, at that point, the warrant had already been signed by the select board. So at that point, the planning board chose to take the action to, um, to, to recommend no action. And so what that means is that um, the, the motion on the floor will actually be to take no action, which effectively just carries over the article uh, until a, a, a future town meeting. Um, and, but it does require a vote to do that. Um, there is some possibility that the, the vote to take no action would be, um, would be um, denied. And if that's the case, then there would be uh, a new motion uh, to move the article forward. So I'll just want to clarify yes. for the public too. So when you Perfect. vote no on no action, then that means a new motion can take place, which could be a voting in the affirmative or an editing, you know, slight amendment to the motion. Yes. So if, if the motion of no action is, is uh, denied, then we would likely move forward with a new motion, which would be the, uh, the, the article as it stands um, in the warrant. And then that would in, in turn initiate discussion and debate and an eventual vote on the article um, as written in the warrant. Okay, and so then what if someone, say they vote down no action, and then someone brings a new motion forward and they vote no on the new motion, then what happens? Okay, so if, if the motion was to, 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 say for example, the solar overlay, if the, if the motion um, to move no action was denied, um, then there would be a new motion to um, recommend the solar overlay um, for the town of Hopkinton as stated in the warrant. Um, there would be debate, and if, if that new motion was denied, um, then we would have no solar overlay. Um, the article cannot be brought back forth um, in its current state in a future for, for two years. But if there are material changes to the proposed article, then it can be brought back in um, the, next, the next town meeting. 
Okay, I think that's important for people to know because zoning articles usually require a two thirds vote, uh, a majority, and that can be really hard to get. Some articles might get 60%, but if they don't get the two thirds, they're not gonna go forward. Yeah, that's but, a great point. Two thirds is a, is, a, is a big threshold and it, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like a big difference from 50%, but just having been to a lot of town meetings, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger threshold than people expect. And um, it really is a, you know, it's a, it's a super majority. It takes some, takes a, the over the, the majority of, not the majority, but it takes a, a super majority of, of people in town to be supportive of it. Okay, so say an article comes for a vote, it does not get the super majority, um, then it, it could be brought back in a future year if it's changed to some, it changed enough, I guess, and they would have a new hearing. And then if it, it has back. material changes to material it, changes. then it can be brought back. So for the solar overlay district, for example, if the map changed, maybe that would be a material change. Possibly, yes. Possibly, okay. So that is good to know. I think that covers the basic questions about um, how zoning articles work. So I thought maybe we could do a quick overview of some of the key zoning articles. I know some of them are housekeeping, but um, this one, article number 13 about car washes in the downtown business district. People will probably remember that last year, a similar article came forward and got a majority, but not the super majority. So it was voted down. So what's yeah, the difference this year? Yeah, great example. So the, the article last year was to, um, to, to add car washes um, as a special permit in, um, in the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on it, but I think it's the industrial A or B. I don't remember which one it is. I think it was, yeah, the one at South Street, but I believe. Effectively over on South Street. And then at the same time, remove car washes from the downtown business district. And what we heard at town meeting is that people... Um, really didn't feel that they weren't they weren't convinced that we should um, uh, allow for car washes over um, on South Street, but they definitely felt that we should not allow for car washes by special permit in the downtown business district. So this article removes car washes as an allowable use in the downtown business district, um, but doesn't add them anywhere else. Doesn't add them anywhere else. Correct. Okay, good to know. Okay, Article Sixteen is about accessory dwelling units. So, if you could explain what that is, people may not understand. Yeah, so so accessory dwellings are, um, you know, are 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 uh, uh, living quarters that are um, part of a single family residence, but are separate. So, if you had um, a, you know, a, an apartment, or you know, what we'd call a, a mother in law apartment, or a, a granny flat, or um, you know, any type of, of separate living quarters that's in a, um, in a, uh, a, a single family residence that would be considered an accessory dwelling. And it this article, proposed. Yeah. yeah, so this article updates the zoning bylaws, uh, really does two things. Number one, it removes the requirement that occupants must be family, quote, related by blood, marriage, or adoption. And it also removes an age restriction. So the previous accessory dwelling um, bylaw um, stated that that uh, it must be occupied by um, a family member related by blood marriage or adoption um, or um, that they needed to be uh, over the age of I believe it was 55. Um, so this removes that and, and really the, the basis for this is there are many living situations that were previously not allowed that, that we think would be appropriate. Um, if you had a, a caretaker, if you had um, unmarried partners of, of adult children, if you had uh, an adult with a disability of some kind, um, a lot of different circumstances that, that we think would be a reasonable um, use for an accessory dwelling that, that previously weren't allowed. Okay. Um, and then the second part of it is removing the requirement for an interior connection. So previously, um, the accessory dwelling had to have an interior door that would connect the two spaces um, and you know, and, and again, I think the, the argument for us here is that, um, you know, by, by removing that, you could have a wholly separate living quarters. Um, and then also you could have uh, an independent structure to serve as an accessory dwelling. So, you know, so like you had what a they detached... call like the granny pod or something. Yes, yes, yes okay. exactly. Um, and I do, do want to note too, that there are a lot of other additional details and requirements. Um, you know, I know that, that both Zach and the planning board have had a lot of discussions about this. And what we want to make sure is we want to make sure that, you know, single family resident neighborhoods don't turn into to multifamily apartment buildings and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that probably the, 
the most relevant pieces are number one that that you know the second unit does need to be a, an, an accessory and it also needs to be quite a bit smaller. So there's a maximum square footage of 800 square feet, which um, again is just to sort of drive home the the primary versus the secondary use of the um, of the units. Okay, great. Okay, Article uh, 17 is non-conforming lots, uses, and structures. I think this was requested by the Board of Appeals. They see a lot of these. Yes, that's correct. Um, and so this article would allow for a waiver by the zoning enforcement officer um, for modifications to non-conforming lots that either that, that don't alter the footprint or overall height of the pre-existing structure. So what that means, if you have a non-conforming lot, which means it doesn't quite fit into the standard zoning requirements, but it was built a long time ago. Um, currently, if you wanted to make a modification to it, such as adding dormers or maybe screening in a porch or something like that, um, you would have to go in front of the, the, the Board of Appeals. And um, what this amendment does is it allows for a waiver by the zoning enforcement officer um, when the, the footprint isn't changed, when the height isn't changed, um, and assuming you have signatures of all of your abutters. So it's just trying to sort of uh, eliminate what the Board of Appeals feels is an unnecessary, um, you know, it's an unnecessary type of, type of hearing that, that they, they think there's a, a cleaner, simpler way to, um, to, to address these, these types of, of changes. And I know I've seen those in my neighborhood. I live in an older neighborhood and the neighbor wanted to remove a porch and add a new one that was exactly the same size as the one removed. But because that one that was being removed was too close to the property line for current standards, they had to go to Board of Appeals. Yeah, so, great example. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and the next one, uh, the number 18 is temporary signs. And I think this relates to the Main Street Corridor project and other, yep. other construction projects. Yep, it does. Um, and, uh, you know, and this is really born out of um, trying to support local businesses, um, in particular through the Main Street Corridor project, um, recognize that there's going to be a lot of disruption and that the, there may be different parking arrangements and um, different street flows and whatnot. So um, this article just uh, it allows for um, expanded use of temporary signs for businesses impacted by construction. Um, important to note that it, it does apply across um, you know, any zone where businesses are today. Um, so it's not just the Main Street Corridor project. We felt that it was important that we're not writing in bylaws that have kind of a, a very, very uh, a limited period of use. And we, we felt that the idea of temporary signage for businesses impacted by construction made sense regardless of, of what zone they were in. Okay. All right. And then now um, article number 19 is the one that I think is going to probably generate the most discussion at town meeting about um, commercial solar volatility. Um, in installations. Yeah. And do you want to go over a little bit what that intends to do? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, some standard questions about it too. So, um, you know, I, I would say just in my time on the planning board, the, the, the commercial solar proposals have been some of the most challenging to, to deal with. And, um, you know, and, and I, and, and one of the, so, so this is really an attempt for us to gain a little bit more, um, control over where these commercial solar farms are are installed or where they're where they're approved, um, and to make sure that we're also protecting our residential neighborhoods and our our natural resources. So, just to summarize, currently today, um, commercial solar is uh, an allowable use in any of our zoning districts. Um, it is allowable by special permit. Um, there are numerous additional requirements, uh, including a three acre minimum lot size, there's screening requirements, there's underground utility requirements. Um, and actually, uh, even at town meeting last year, we made some additional modifications to the, the solar bylaw that, that actually, um, we hope, improves the, the screening and, and, and really trying to, to um, help reduce the negative impact on, on abutters. But the, 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 at the end of the day, they're, they're still allowed in any commercial zone. Um, and so the Zoning Advisory Committee was looking at how other towns have, have managed the situation. And one of the things they found is that some towns um, have created a, uh, a commercial solar overlay, which actually specifies um, you know, specific parcels in which solar is allowed, thereby 
um, not allowing it in on parcels that are not included within that solar overlay district. So um, in the new model that we propose, we've, we've had a lot of debate. Um, we've had a lot of discussion. We've had a lot of public input here. Um, we've created a, a, a map of what we think are appropriate parcels with some consideration that, that details that. Um, and in the new process, um, same as before, that it's still subject to planning board and conservation committee review. Um, it still has, uh, those properties still have screening and setback requirements, um, lot size, screening underground utilities, uh, all still, all still apply. Okay. And I should just add one more point that I should have mentioned earlier really quickly. Um, solar, when used as an accessory use, meaning not the primary use of the property, uh, like on a rooftop or over a parking lot, is still allowed and would continue to be allowed in any zoning district. So this doesn't impact your ability to put solar on a roof or it doesn't affect Dell EMC's ability to put it on uh, over a parking lot or you know, any other municipal building or that sort of thing. It's really only these commercial solar proposals that we're talking about here. Okay, so homeowners can still put solar panels on their roof whether or not they live in the solar overlay district if it were to pass. Correct. Okay, and businesses can put it on their parking lots. Okay, and then let's see, and how will this affect if it passes any current solar projects that are um, in the works but not built yet? Yeah, so um, that's a tricky one. Um, and um, so, so let me just try and summarize this, but under Massachusetts law, a proposed change to a zoning bylaw will apply to any special permit that a planning board issues after the board's notice for the public hearing on that zoning change. So let me just explain what that means because I think a lot of questions come up on the Seaboard Solar proposal over on Franklin Road. Um, that was, uh, that special permit um, was approved by the planning board earlier this year. Um, but that planning board was done uh, after the board noticed for the solar overlay uh, public hearing. So what that means is that if this uh, overlay were to move forward and it were approved, um, then the amended zoning bylaw will apply to Franklin Road special permit, which means the Franklin Road project developer will be prevented by the amending zoning bylaw to proceed with the project. Okay. And say, I guess they probably won't have it built by before town meeting. If it would, were already built, they would not have that obstacle, right? If That's correct. Okay, yes. So if they had already, if they had already, they had already been issued all their permits, mm -hmm. um, then they would not be affected. Okay. So that's certainly a lot for everybody to think about, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion at town meeting on it. I think it's worth noting, um, you know, so, so with regards to the map, if I could just make a few comments on it. Um, yeah. And, you know, and again, this was really hard to figure out where, it, what parcels it makes sense to include in the solar overlay. And, you know, Zach, I, I should just say, going back to the, the, the meeting process, um, Zoning Advisory Committee had uh, talked about this over a series of, of five public meetings. Um, the planning board has discussed it at six planning meetings. Um, all of those have been well represented by the public of, of those both in support and, and oppo in opposition of the solar overlay project. Um, and, you know, really what, what Zoning Advisory Committee used for consideration is, is four things. Uh, number one, um, how far is the parcel from residential neighborhoods? Um, two, how much of the property is, is wooded and you know, with the intent of really trying to limit, um, limit clear cutting or, or disturbing the, the, um, the, the, the current makeup of the land. Uh, three, ample space on the lot for visual screening to make sure that uh, you know, people don't have a, a wall of, of solar panels up, up next to them. Um, and then uh, we also did consider uh, lots that were previously approved for commercial solar. Okay. So I think um, we'll move on to the CPC articles now. Um, I know you're not the chair of the CPC, but, um, but you serve on that committee. So um, let's see, do, could you give a, a brief overview of what the CPC is and wh where the money comes from for these projects? Yeah, so the, the, the CPC uh, was born out of the Community Preservation Act. Um, it's a Massachusetts program that was um, started in, in, in 2000. Um, so it's, it's 20 years in existence. And basically the way it works is that 
Um, Hopkinton has a, a, a tax surcharge on our property taxes. Um, and that money goes into a fund. And then that fund gets um, a partial match from, um, from state resources um, that, that, that give the town uh, additional funds to spend on, on various forms of what we call community preservation. And that fits into a couple of different buckets. Um, and those buckets could be, um, could be recreation, they could be preservation, they could be um, open space, um, um, acquiring affordable open ha- space, uh, affordable, affordable housing, housing is one. Yeah, mm-hmm. store of preservation. Yep, yep. yep. So, so it's really just a, it's a means for the town to get some, um, to get some additional support from the state to invest in things that, that, that we believe are important um, for our community in those different, different categories of, of spending. And the nice thing is, I believe it's a 2% surcharge on our taxes. And so the money, we already have the money because it's already been collected. So it's not an asking for an override or debt exclusion on these yep, projects. That is correct. Okay. And then a lot of the CPC requests every year are very small, under 25000 But I thought maybe we should go over the ones that are a little bit larger this year. So number 12C is 400000 for store preservation of the exterior of the Hopkins Center for the Arts. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so hopefully people know what the Hopkins Center for the Arts is. It, it, you know, the, the barn went through a fairly substantial renovation a few years ago, and they've um, updated many parts of the interior of the building as well. Um, this is for um, preserving the exterior of the original farmhouse that, that's in front. What used um, to be the haunted house when my kids were little. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, I, I, I know of it as a Terry farm. Yeah. Um, but, um, but, but yeah, so that's, and, and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's funds that would be to, to renovate the exterior of the house and to do so in a, in a, you know, through a historic preservation lens. Great. Okay. So uh, number 12 F is $74,000 for a campus trail connector. And I hope this isn't the one that was removed. Was it? No, I think this is still on there. Uh, no, this is, I think this is still on there. Okay. Um, and, and so this actually, um, you know, one of the things that they're looking to do is they're looking to, to provide further connectivity between the different, um, between the different school campuses within Hopkinton. Um, and this money also ties to a grant from the state. So um, again, um, you know, Hopkinton isn't footing the entire bill for this. It really is, is extending uh, and, and building new trails um, between a couple of our um, between a couple of our school campuses. Okay, and then number twelve I is seventy five thousand dollars for stormwater drainage, but for the skate park at EMC Park. I think. Um, yes. So for those of you that know EMC Park, um, you know last year actually CPC funded the the playground improvements, um, and there was previously a skate park back there that. Um, that uh, Parks and Rec actually proposed um, a, a refresh and, and, and remodeling of the skate park. Um, but one of the problems back there is that um, there's, there's some pretty substantial stormwater drainage issues back behind the skate park. And so in, in discussions with the CPC and the Parks and Rec, they decided that before they go allocate and support money to design and build a new skate park, that they should probably solve um, the stormwater drainage issue first um, it was number one and the number two, given that, um, you know, I, I think given that we don't really have a, a good firm estimate as to what the skate park costs, then this $75,000 would also, um, support, um, a, a more accurate, um, design and bid for the skate park so that, uh, in a, in a future year, um, CPC can come to annual town meeting with, a um, uh, more accurate and specific ask to, to build out the skate park. Okay, that sounds good. And um, let's see, and because we're trying to limit how much time we spend physically at town meeting this year, if residents um, still have questions about CPC articles or zoning articles, is there someone they can email or call um, maybe at town hall to get more yeah. information? Yeah, um, so, so um, planning questions can go to John Gelsich, our, our town planner, and he's a, a great resource. Um, and he's, um, he's at, at town hall. Okay. Um, for CPC related um, matter, I, I should say also for planning board matter, you can always reach out to, to me as well. And, um, and uh, my address is located, my email address is located on the, the Hopkinton website. Um, 
And then um, for CPC related questions, I'd really recommend reaching out to, to Ken Weissmantle, who is the chair of the CPC. Um, and he, his uh, CPC email is also available on, on the town website. Okay. Yeah. And I really do recommend that people um, ask their questions in advance if they can, so that we can reduce the time of, that we have to ask questions at town meeting. So if you have planning board related uh, questions, you can always reach out to me and to Amy's point. We'd rather ask you ahead of time. And if we can answer those just to, again, kind of minimize the discussion and uh, debate that we have at town meeting. Uh, my email is planning board chair at Hopkinton MA dot G O V. So planning board chair at Hopkinton MA dot G O V. Okay, great. And then I think that's about wraps it up. Just want to thank everybody for watching the video and we have some reminders just about town meeting in general that you'll want to get up early. It's on a Saturday, Saturday, uh, September 12th at 9.30 a.m., but you can show up as early as 8.30 a.m. to get a seat. Um, uh, once you get seated, the chairs are going to be all spaced socially distance apart, about six feet apart, and you're not allowed to move them closer to your friends, neighbors, or household members. So just pick your seat and stay there. Bring your own uh, water and snacks. Um, once you're seated, your activity is limit limiting to getting up to speak at the mic or to use the restroom, and they're going to have porta potties out there. Um, please do try to get your questions answered in advance so the meeting can move along quickly. A huge thank you to Gary Trundle, a planning board chair, for meeting with us today, and of course to HCAM for producing this show. And there are three other segments. Um, there will be the interview with the select board and town manager, um, an interview with the town clerk and moderator, and an interview with the school committee and superintendent. Uh, let's see. So we'll see you Saturday, September 12th at the high school outside. Start um, Check-in starts at 8.30, and the meeting starts at 9.30.